see us so can you go to internet and you go to whatever you're I'll get you started yeah it's been gone for 10 minutes all right well it looks like we have a full crowd this afternoon good evening everybody welcome to the Duke Lemur Center my name is Chris I serve as the Lemur Center's education specialist and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our restart of our evening with the experts. And tonight we have an expert among experts, at least when it comes to Madagascar lemurs, lemur predators, and conservation. Dr. Luke Dollar has been doing conservation science around lemurs and in Madagascar, and specifically the FUSA, the top lemur predator in Madagascar, for nearly two decades. To start off with an anecdote, when I was a student at Duke University, I was taking conservation biology and a part of the Big Cat Initiative team with National Geographic, which you may have seen literature for outside, with Luke Dollar. And because he had talked to us about FUSA and lemurs and conservation work in Madagascar, I asked him one day, because I was also working here at the Lemur Center, and just started. So I was fresh and passionate and all that good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Luke, lemurs I know are really good at avoiding predators. You know, they live in groups, they have these loud alarm calls. I was like, but Based on everything you've told me about FUSA, what chance do lemurs really have? How do they survive living with these really incredible predators? And Luke said, they don't. <laughs> Talk to Luke Dollar. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, and I'm glad it was that story and not the one I was afraid you were about to get. There you go. <laughs> Guys, it's really nice to be home. 23 years ago, last month, I sat foot on Duke's campus for the first time, and I set foot on the Lemur Center property for the first time as an entering freshman in Duke. As a high school student, I'd gone to a recruitment um, uh, event for Duke, and I heard about Patricia Wright and her discovery of the Golden Bamboo Lemur. She was a professor here at the time. I saw slides of Elwyn Simons, famous, a famous primate uh, anthropologist uh, in the Fayum of Egypt, digging up fossils of primate ancestors. And as a result of that, I filled out one college application, and that was to Duke. In retrospect, that probably wasn't the smartest thing. <laughs> But I got an early decision, and I knew that this was where I wanted to be because this place is here in the context of this university here in North Carolina. And so, truly, it's good to be home. Now, my freshman year, uh, that was a long time ago. That was the late 80s. Um, I got a job as a primate technician here at the Lemur Center. That was my introduction not only to the wonderful world of biodiversity outside of the rural south, but of also uh, the world and Duke as a whole. To me, the Lemur Center, it was then called the Primate Center, and Duke are intrinsically linked. They are one and the same, as, as I'm sure you all feel the same way. I had no idea that 23 years later, I would be standing up here talking about uh, you know, two decades worth, worth of work. Uh, but it's a pleasure to talk about these things and talk about how we went from here in the Lemur Center, uh, working as undergrads, uh, to uh, Madagascar, and what all that has resulted from that wonderful experience and opportunity that was afforded right here. Literally, this room existed even then, too. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is mainly the FUSA, 
in Madagascar, lemur's primary predator. It's okay, you can boo now. You will keep booing. <laughs> uh, and and the, the conservation work that you know may have come from working on FUSA, but in fact impacts an entire you know, ecosystem uh, and is actually applicable to carnivore conservation as a whole throughout the world. Now, I don't have to go into a lot of review for you guys here. You're on the Lemur Center campus here. You know about Madagascar. But you also know that all of the primates found on Madagascar are endemic. You know that about 93% of all the reptiles and amphibians, more than half of the birds, uh, upwards of 80, 85% of all plants and animals found on Madagascar are endemic. They're only found there because Madagascar is a special place that's been isolated for so long. You're also aware that they're facing quite the conundrum that comes from human population growth and people doing what they must do in the absence of alternatives. When I first went to Madagascar the summer after my junior year, there were 12 million people on Madagascar in the summer of 1994. Now that number is approaching 24 million people. In the interim 20 years, the popula human population size of Madagascar has roughly doubled. The problems are no less severe. It's easy to say they are more severe now than they were even then. But we've come a long way in the interim period. We knew as early as the 80s that Madagascar was in a conservation crisis. We knew even then that maybe 10% of the original extent of eastern rainforests, those east coast rainforests, were remaining. We may not have had as deep a grasp as we do now that the dry forests in the west have less than 5% remaining. Uh, the, the, the dry forest is where I've done most of my work over the last several years, but the rainforests were where I cut my teeth as a Duke undergraduate, and uh, you'll hear some of the stories that, that came from there as well. Needless to say, there's a conservation conundrum there. There's a crisis in which people and wildlife are constantly colliding over battles for the habitat and the natural resources that remain. It is up for us who see this occurring and who have the ability to impact that in a positive way for the people and the biodiversity of Madagascar. What I want to talk to you about is my path as a scientist and coming to realize that. Three quarters of those nearly 24 million people on Madagascar are subsistence farmers. They grow the food they eat to survive. Now, the best place to grow rice is unfortunately where beautiful forests, healthy forests are growing. And when these areas are cleared, rice is pretty intensively grown, but the, the topsoils, which are already pretty poor, unfortunately get washed away. They have very seasonal, very heavy rains. And if you look at a satellite image of Madagascar during the rainy season, it looks like the country is hemorrhaging its life's blood into the Indian Ocean, because in a sense, literally it is. As that topsoil goes, as those nutrients go, more habitat needs to be converted for more agriculture. And in the absence of an alternative, you see beautiful, beautiful savannas like this. Unfortunately, this is supposed to be dry forest. This is not supposed to be savanna. This is not supposed to look like the savannas in East Africa. This is supposed to look like good, dry, deciduous forest. But because it's been cut over and it's been burned over as well by people setting fires to burn off the dead grasses to grow new green shoots for their cattle, there's really no chance of that coming back in the short term. What we have is critical to maintain because we're not going to get it back in the lifetime. We're truly not. Um, additionally, erosion, once you have that matrix of leaf litter and root systems in the, that, are, that are holding the topsoil and the soils in place, those rains wash the topsoil down. And as we know, water goes downhill. It carries everything as it can with it. Uh, where I'm standing here to this point here is about a mile. This is not a beautiful natural canyon. This is an erosion belt that we have watched double in size in the last 12 years. This problem. Now, when I first went to Madagascar, I had no idea about any of this. When I first came to Duke as an undergraduate, I had no idea about any of this. What did I want to do? I wanted to learn about lemurs. Believe it or not, I wanted to feed them. I wanted to shovel their poop. <laughs> and I did it a lot. <laughs> And all my freshman year, this is what I did with every Saturday, and, and, and you know, a couple hours, a couple of days during the week, and, and Sunday afternoons, this is what I was doing. And at the end of my freshman year, Blue Devil was born. Who here knows who Blue Devil is? First I.I. born in captivity in this hemisphere. Blue Devil was born at the end of my freshman year. And I actually convinced Ken Glander, who was then the director of the Primate Center, 
to when I came back my sophomore year. Let me do an independent study looking at mother-infant interrelationships and infant development in the I. I'm a sophomore in college, and I'm getting an opportunity to work with these unbelievable animals. They gave me keys. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> and, and, and so now all my nights were spent at the primate center looking at the, at the inversion time between day and, uh, day and night. It's reversed in the, in the enclosures there where the eye and I are kept uh, to look at when they come out and they go in what the mothers and the infants are doing in terms of interrelationships. You know, when finally after doing this for 10 weeks, Blue Devil emerges from a nest box. <laughs> awesome stuff. And then that evolved into later um, looking at percussive foraging, this wonderful tapping that I and I do as they're going along substrates, figuring out what it is about what's in the subsurface of the wood that they key on to know they can use those continuously growing rodent-like teeth to dig into the wood. It's not, the, it's not they're hearing echoes from the holes. We found out by doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wood blocks that were, that were backfilled with everything imaginable, what we found out was any subsurface anomaly, when they're tapping and they're listening, they can pick up on this. And it can be a, a, a plug that's taken out of the wood and then completely backfilled with the exact same wood and glued in place, and they would still find it every single time. It wasn't just the holes. They're amazing animals. These animals occupy the niche of woodpeckers in Madagascar. They better be good at that, otherwise they don't get to eat the grubs that they eat so much. Mm -hmm. But the summer after my, fresh, my uh, junior year, I actually convinced one of the professors here to take me to Madagascar as a field assistant. Great! <laughs> I've never been anywhere, and I'm going to Madagascar. Why? This is cool. And so here I am in the rainforest. We're doing a feeding ecology study. So these cat-like, cat-sized primates in the tops of trees in Ranamafana National Park in southeastern Madagascar, rainforest, you know, they're going through the tops of trees, and we have binoculars, and we're collecting data on what they're eating, how many chews per mouthful, uh, and things like this, which is a lot of fun until you realize that they're going through the trees, and you have to up the slippery hillside, and down the slippery hillside, and through the swamp, and up the slippery hillside, and they're just going through the tree. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard work. They gave the new kid, me, uh, Stanzi to follow. Stanzi was one of Deborah Oberdorf, the professor I was there with at the time, one of her old um, uh, PhD thesis study animals. It had this old radio collar that didn't work anymore. But it was old school technology, and as we know from Ataris and things like that, they get kind of clunky, right? If you're under 30, you don't even know what an Atari is. <laughs> I've just dated myself. But um, this, this big clunky radio call on the whip antenna was easy for the new kid to study, which was great because it took about six weeks to actually work the groove. And if you've studied primates in the wild or arboreals in the wild, you'll know that you actually have to wear this groove into your vertebrae in order to do this <laughs> for hours and hours and hours on end. Um, by the way, the leeches climb trees and they drop when the heat source is beneath them, so we got leeches in our eyes and all these things. But it wasn't a leech that made me lose sight of Stanzi. Stanzi disappeared from the group. And this concerned me, but you know, Deborah had seen that um, the, the animals would break away from groups even though they live in these, these relatively large social groups, and they'll come back a few days later. Well, a few days later, Stanzi wasn't back. And we turned on the um, radio telemetry receiver for the signal for the caller that was working in the group to go find them in their lemur lump in the morning. It's very important to get out there before they start moving. And we heard the beep of that radio caller. But then we started hearing ticking. And nobody else was using radio telemetry in the area. So we knew that something different was going on there. We tuned into the frequency that this ticking was coming from, and it was coming from the frequency of this collar that Stanzi had had that hadn't worked in years. Our interest was peaked. So we went to where the sleep tree that Stanzi had to be was with a suddenly reworking radio collar, and we looked around, and we looked around, and we looked around, and we couldn't find Stanzi anymore. And then we looked down. There were a few tufts of fur, some bone fragments, and a chewed up radio collar, and our guide, the guy named Pierre Talata, said, a fusa guide. And my life was changed forever, but unfortunately I thought my life was about to end because Pierre blanched. He was terrified, and I thought a tiger was going to come down out of the underbrush, <laughs> and I really wish I'd done a little more homework at the time <laughs> because I thought we were all going to die because he did, and this guy was fearless. He was never lost. He knew these forests like the back of his hand, and he wanted to go home. And so, of course, my next question is, what's a fusa? Natural next question. 
And he said, oh, it's Mashiach coming, Mashiach coming, which in Algezi means bloodthirsty, fierce. You know, if, if, if you want to have a beware of dog sign, you have a leak on Mashiach on, 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 on your sign that says beware of dog because the dog's mean. So that was all I could learn, really. And then I came back here and went to Perkins Library, went to the Biocide Library. I couldn't find anything else. Moose had been described in the mid-1800s, and we didn't know anything about this top predator on Madagascar. And I said, hmm, maybe I want to work on predators <laughs> instead of primates instead. So the summer after my uh, senior year, I convinced Carl Van Schaik, another professor from here, to take me to Indonesia to study orangutans in North Sumatra. It was great. It was awesome. They live over swamps. <laughs> <laughs> So I thought the hills in Madagascar were bad, but then here, we're in swamps. Orangutans are big and they're strong and they're really, really smart and they think throwing trees at you is funny. <laughs> and you can't get away because you're in a swamp. Oh. Um, but the coolest thing about that summer was actually not the orangutans, which were pretty awesome. But it was, I was on a boardwalk all by myself. We had these planks that were over the swamp that we had to go long distances in one direction and we could go on the boardwalk. I was all by myself and I was listening for this crashing sound that the orangutans make when they're going through the woods. And I caught something out of the corner. And a clouded leopard stepped out on the plank and it started walking towards me. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> what do I do? So I just stayed very, very still and it kept coming and it kept coming. And then it walked off the other side of the plank and disappeared like smoke. I walked out to where it was, didn't see it. but there were wet footprints, so I knew I wasn't just having a, a methylical moment where you were the anti yeah, yeah. was messing with my head. And that was pretty much what sealed the deal that I wanted to study predators instead of primates. Mm -hmm. And so 96, the following year, I went to back to Madagascar, back to Ronald McFarland, that same campsite, and lo and behold, we caught a FUSA. First time people were catching FUSA in the rainforest in Madagascar, and it worked. We actually had to build the traps ourselves. They were made out of wood. Um, they were really, really heavy. They took two people to move around because we're doing this by the seat of our pants. We're trying to figure it out as we go. First time we caught one, it blew the entire side of the trap out. This, this was a trap that weighed probably 60, 70 pounds. Made of solid wood with slats in the side. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I really want to catch one of these. <laughs> we did. We got it darted, we got a radio collar on it, we started following it, it was great. Found out that they didn't like to be followed like the lemurs do. You can follow the lemurs and watch them, they'll habituate themselves, not so much with Fusa. Makes sense, it's an ambush type predator, it sneaks up on things for them and eats them. We're not exactly cryptic when we're moving through the forest, so we kind of cramp their style. Um, a few days later, the signal started coming from the Nemorina River. Oh no. I did something wrong with the radio collar. It hooked on something, it's drowned. What's, what, what, what happened? We dragged the river, we found the radio collar. It had been cut from the FUSA. There's no way FUSA could make a perfect cut along the side of the radio collar in the one place where the antenna wasn't to get it thrown in the river. So we did some investigation. And my first study animal ever, I walked into a village a few weeks later uh, probably walking through the village from one part of the forest to the next, and was killed. Learned very quickly that I was going to have to do a lot of conservation work if I was going to do some science at the same time, and I didn't want that science to be about you know, lost populations or an extinct species by the end of my career. And now more than half of what we do in Madagascar is actually conservation and development work as opposed to just long-term ecological and, and population research on the FUSA. It takes a lot of work to catch FUSA. I use big teams of people because if we're hiking 15, 20 miles a day, twice a day along trap lines, it's a lot of work. you got to check them twice a day, sometimes three times a day if the, if, the, if, the, if the weather's really bad and we definitely don't want them in there any longer than that. And so it takes a lot of work. We have to put out a lot of traps. We have to check these traps. While we're checking the traps, we do ecological censuses. We collect data on everything we see and encounter. Um, for me, I want to know what's on the menu for food service. So we collect data on this. It also gives us a long-term biodiversity database for the whole areas where we're working. We've been working in Ankara Fonska now since 1998. So that's useful information to see what's happening from year to year and notice the trends. And so what we're going for, though, is a FUSA in a trap. And when we get a FUSA in a trap, whoever's on the trap team gives us a call on the satellite phone if, if, if it ain't you and our two-way radios aren't working. Often they're not. Um, 
lots of topography, lots of distance. Um, and the staff veterinarian and I will go out there and we're going to anesthetize the FUSA. We're going to take it back to the central processing area. And so when it's in the trap, people don't approach the trap. They stay away so it's not agitated any more than it has to be. We load a dart. We go up to it. This is my four-year-old, now five-year-old son, Zach, uh, when I took him to Madagascar for the first time last year. And he just went with me again for the second time this year. Um, he likes it. I'm not allowed to go back to what he calls camp out without him, um, <laughs> which works for me. Uh, and, and so we, we, we dart the FUSA, uh, we pull it out, we make sure it's okay. Um, uh, at this point, it's, it's, it's out. Um, we make sure that the, the eyes are well lubricated and, and the animal is okay, and we take it back to a central processing area. This is a really uh, small, young adult female that we've caught. We take it back to a central processing area where we collect every single pus. Can you see very well? Tell me a little bit. <laughs> um, okay, and so what we're doing here is we're doing weight measurements, we're taking blood samples, we're taking tissue samples, we're putting microchips in the thing in case we radio call it, or if we catch it again later and the ear tags have fallen out, we can still, if anybody's ever gone to the vet and had a microchip put between your pet shoulder blades, we use the exact same kind. Uh, we put ear tags on it. Um, we do everything we possibly can. We look at endoparasites, ectoparasites, everything we can while this animal is asleep. If we're doing rate telemetry this year, we're going to be putting satellite collars on them, which is great to, to really get fine scale microhabitat stuff. I'm very excited about that starting next year. Uh, and we have a limited amount of time because guess what happens if we're not done when the animal starts picking up? We're done. <laughs> um, obviously, this is not a tiger. This is not something that's going to come bursting out from the underbrush, but even the Malagasy people have no um, general realization that the big bad wolf of Madagascar weighs about as much as a cocker spaniel. Uh, and then once, and, and again veterinarians are on, on staff the whole time, this is Zawabana who just finished her vet degree in, in Madagascar and is, is also with us. And then we release the animal at its capture site uh, with a radio collar for doing radio telemetry without if we're not. And so we release it right at its capture site once it's recovered from, from the cage. And then a lot more fun begins. You now, one of the questions we had was, primatologists always think that if something's eating their focal species, that it must be a specialist on eating those. FUSA had the reputation that they, they just eat lemurs. That's all they eat. So one of the first questions we had to ask was, well, what are FUSA eating? They eat everything in Madagascar naturally found in the forest there with a heartbeat. <laughs> Remember I told you they don't tolerate us following them? Uh, to see what they're preying upon. So the way we figure this out is we go through what's left behind. Poop. And we've gone through over a thousand pieces of scat at this point, um, and, and it's very difficult to have lots of great help from lots of people uh, in, in Madagascar that, that are helping with that too. It makes it, makes it fun for my Burke Morph students every once in a while to say, hey, what's this? And uh, it's a distal humerus of a mouse lemur, and I ask them, which one? Left or right, and so it's not very fair, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but it's fun. Um, and you know, Fusa had this reputation of being a chicken thief, and I doubt that they'd steal one if they got the chance, but there's a lot more going on with their habitat than just direct persecution on them. And we pay attention to this stuff because that's a real point of concern if the habitat needs to be converted because somebody wants to illegally sell the rosewood or ebony that is in the remaining protected areas. If people don't have an alternative to this endless cycle of slash and burn agriculture, it's a problem. Um, what you see here wrapped in the banana leaves is called Rambo, spelled like Rambo, as in John Rambo, as in First Blood, uh, because it's the Malagasy equivalent of Viagra. It comes from a plant in Encarafonsco where I do uh, most of my work up in the Northwest and where our team's been since 98. And um, uh, this was pretty much one of the few things that was a part of the local economy other than doing slash and burn agriculture um, 15, 20 years ago. And in 2000, um, a local women's group said, will you help us build a campsite? We want the tourists that come here to stay with us in the village. We want the tourists that come here, we want the researchers that come here to stay with us in the village. Um, we could make money off of this. They came up with this. We just happened to be there at the right place in the right time and said, sure, we'll help with this. So they converted their soccer field into the Ambudi Manga campsite. Um, the soccer field really sucked anyway because it was on a slope. So you kind of knew who was going to win. Um, yeah, yeah not, not, not good odds in gambling. 
at that particular that particular camp, that uh, soccer field. But they built this refectoire in the middle and lots of campsites all around. And so the women's group uh, that's made up of women representatives from multiple villages around Nicaragua, Mexico, were managing this campsite. Uh, and it's supporting researchers and ecotourists, and it's now served more than 150,000 plates of food at the cost of about a dollar each. In a country where most of the population is living on less than two dollars a day, that helps find an alternative to slash and burn agriculture. Um, this is what it looks like. You know, three hots in a cot, um, and they're making all the profits. They're using the profits to improve the campsite and expand the campsite, obviously put wells in their villages instead of having to pull water from the crocodile-infested local lake, put permanent um, roofing materials on their houses as opposed to just, uh, just, just palms, which have to be replenished from the forest at, at, over, over time. And so that's expanded then further into other things that can help uh, alleviate these anthropogenic, these human-based pressures in Madagascar. The Rocket Stones Project. Um, in Madagascar, every meal is rice. You cook rice three meals a day, you eat rice three meals a day. Um, the rate limiting factor, I think, to progress in rural Madagascar is the amount of time it takes to cook rice. It takes a long time. It's cooked over an open flame, sort of a three-step pot method. Uh, and one of my Malagasy graduate students said, I want to start this initiative, the rocket stove initiative. And so it's a fuel-efficient wood-burning stove. Um, burns wood or charcoal, cuts rice cooking time in half. Also, uh, because it's in this rocket cylinder um, system that the pot sits on top. Um, this is the first model, which was really heavy and harder to move. This is the second model, which is which is cheaper and easier to move. Um, uh, because all the, the heat is going up into the pot, it, it's much more efficient. Um, a lot of the, the soot and smoke is actually burned off in the chamber itself. So in the corner of the house, which would be the kitchen in someone's house in Madagascar, it's about the third of the size of this room, um, you don't have as much sort of pollution in the air, so it helps in that sense as well. It cuts cooking time in half, it cuts the amount of wood required to cook the pot of rice in half. So that's that's a little bit of progress there, but instead of us being the people producing these, um, the team goes from village to village around Madagascar, finds an entrepreneur in that village, puts them a kiln, teaches them how to build rocket stoves, and leaves them to it, at which point they build them and they market them and they're a distribution mechanism. We don't have to do it, and they can make money in the process. Real force multiplier there. Works nicely. Um, this is Ankara Fonseca. It's, its forest cover is shown in green here in 1990. This is its forest cover in 2000. This is its forest cover in 2011. What you see here in red is the amount of forest cover that was lost in Ankara Fonseca between 1990 and 2000. About 23% of the overall standing forest of, Ron, of uh, Ankara Fonseca. I've been saying Ankara Fonseca the whole time, right? Ankara Fonseca was, was lost in the decade from 1990 to 2000. This is with a big NGO with a million dollar a year budget and very few people on site. Very few people inter interfacing and interacting with the 10,000 local people that live in and around the park. Um, this, this is the change between 2000 and 2011. There's still some loss. There's still been some fires that have set. You see this new light green color there, which is some regeneration. Now, we're not the sole cause of all that. But I like to think that this comprehensive approach to engaging local communities, working with the, the, the Madagascar National Parks, Houston and Gap, I have to stop every time, so like saying Duke Bloomer Center instead of Duke Bryan Center, um, uh, working with, with all the stakeholders we can, I think, to turn things around with what's going on there. It doesn't stop there, though. In this system, we watched, because we're doing this as a part of a long term, we watched hyacinths arrive and start to expand the end of the big lake. Uh, this is an invasive plant species. Invasive species are a problem. Um, what in the world are we going to do about that? Well, we started trying to just pull them out by hand. We can't keep up with it. 20 people working all day long, keeping up with the biomass production of the hyacinth growing on its own. So, alternative charcoal source. Not forest wood, not trees. Try hyacinths. Burn them in the rocket stones. <laughs> Didn't work quite as well as we wanted to, but it was on the right track. And it turns out that one of the waste products that they have in abundance in Madagascar is rice husks. Rice husks make great alternative charcoal. Ding! Uh, another solution. Uh, invasive species in animal forms also strike. 
Um, we were there when we first started seeing feral dogs coming into our trap lines. And it's important to understand that um, our relationship with pets that we have here is very different than the relationship that people have with domestic animals in Madagascar. We tried relocating these, these dogs 75 kilometers away. They were back in three days. Uh, there is no humane society, there is no rescue service, things like that, particularly at this time that we saw them coming in. And from the first year where we caught one to the next year when we caught four, that same year in all our trap lines we caught four feral dogs and zero food set. So we did have to eradicate the dogs that were in the forest there. We did it with our veterinarians just as it would have been done if you were putting an animal down in the vet clinic. We tried everything else that didn't work, so as humanely as possible we addressed that problem. And within a year, we started catching FUSA again on those trap lines. Um, invasive species are a problem. As Parker would say, please spay and neuter your pets. <laughs> we have spay and neuter programs going on whenever we can uh, be in the field and whenever our vets can be in the field. The great thing about Zawabana, who you saw the picture of earlier, uh, she just got back from Ramafana working with some other people, uh, Zach, Ford, Zach Ferris from Virginia Tech and others, um, doing spay and neuter work down in Ramafana, the rainforest in the southeast where this whole thing started before we went up to the northwest to our fonts to the dry forest there. So this is something that's catching on slowly but surely. Uh, and obviously it's a direct threat and indirect threat from a disease perspective as well. Roads. There's a 12-mile stretch of road that goes through Ankara-Fonska National Park. Guess how many vertebrates a year get hit by cars on that 12-mile stretch of road? About 10,000. 17 kilometers. This is the park, that's the road. Uh, we, this first got on our radio, radar when one of the radio collared FUSA we have was actually hit by a car. Um, hmm, wonder what kind of impact that road has. I did my master's work on the Florida panther, and we know that the leading non-natural cause of mortality of panthers in Florida over the last 30 years or so is roadkill. Uh, so, makes sense. That is something we might want to look at in Madagascar. So we have teams of people, when, when the full team is in the field, we're walking that entire 17 kilometer stretch of road every single day, quantifying exactly what it is that's been hit, how many of them there were. In the dry season, it's a lot less. In the rainy season, oh man, it's like frog massacres. <laughs> it's horrendous. I mean, it, 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 at some point, you just start doing slash lines for ticks. Uh, it's just, it's, it's horrendous. And, and we're just looking at vertebrates. Uh, and obviously we're coming up with a minimum because there's no telling what's being pulled off the road, what gets knocked off the road, what scavengers are getting, etc. Um, how do you find a solution for that? There's no speed limit, there's no police cars, there's no radar guns, there's no speeding tickets, there's no traffic court. Physical barrier to speed. This, these are the mothers of all speed bumps. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> so the most fun I've ever had is sitting well off the side of the road, <laughs> right after these things got installed, and just seeing the discovery process take place. Um, well off the side of the road, and it was, it was accentuated by a cold, frosty beverage, which made it feel better. Um, but in the areas where these two speed bumps were placed, roadkill dropped by 90%, depending on the taxonomic route you look at, between and near those speed bumps. So we're working hard to convince the government that now that there's a democratically elected government in Madagascar once again, hooray, um, to maybe try and put some more speed bumps in because it was shown to be very effective. Uh, a team from Stony Brook called the Ankizi Fund, the paleontologist named Dave Krauss founded, and he has a dental team that comes through, and, and, and dental health is very important, obviously, particularly when there's no medical and dental health at readily, that's readily available with any degree of uh, um, regularity or, or um, uh, technique. Uh, and these guys come through, and, and one of the places where they stop is this campsite that the women's group put together way back when. Um, we get to try and use new cool toys, too. So this is all relevant to lemurs and FUSA, trust me. You know, yeah, this looks really, really fun. Um, and we made our own drones. Um, now, if the local people didn't, if the local people thought we were crazy before, when we started scraping up the roadkill and then flying these remote control airplanes over the, the, uh, the, the park, they knew we were crazy at that point. Uh, but it was great fun by all, and you can see you know, the kids just gathering, because they knew what was going to happen before we did, which was, uh, we were going to crash their, their I.O., there's, there's, there's Andrew, <laughs> Andrew from there. Uh, um, these things are really hard. They're really hard to get to get launched. 
Uh, and so we, we crashed and destroyed a whole lot of But we also were able to get footage like this. And the idea was to be able to go over the horizon to see smokes, trails, or smoke signatures for new fires before they became out of control and see that. But that's another sort of relevant yet not directly the next thing you would come to in thinking about um, biodiversity uh, conservation in terms of tools that are there. So we talked about the first prong of my conservation approach. Find an alternative to the adults. Find an alternative for the adults, not to the adults. <laughs> <laughs> for the adults, away from slash and burn agriculture. Alleviate the cycle by providing education for the next generation to allow them to get out of the cycle by having education, vocational training, to move to a more urban area as opposed to the rural areas where they're going to be forced to do slash and burn agriculture for lack of an alternative. Um, take the kids out into the forest that they were previously not allowed to go into. Show them what the radio collars do. If they're around when we capture FUSA, show them a FUSA. Let them see it. It's not so scary after all. My first instinct is not going to be when I grow up now to go kill a FUSA when somebody says there's a FUSA walking by the village. Great! <laughs> Um, so building schools becomes very, very critical. Uh, our sister NGO, Friends of Madagascar, founded by a guy named Pete Alaski and directed in country by my chief of staff and my first Malagasy graduate student to ever finish with me, uh, Piero Rajanarina. Um, Friends of Madagascar has built or renovated 40 schools in Madagascar over the last 10 years, serving about 5,000 kids in and around protected areas in the country. That's the second prong of that conservation approach. It's a drop in the bucket to what we need, but it's progress. And this is what it looks like when my undergraduates come with me and Zach comes with me to build schools. This is the 40th school going up uh, just last month. Uh, and this is what the construction process looks like with everyone involved. This is our mechanized transport. Um, this is our dump truck and, and bulldozer here. <laughs> um, and so this is what that school, which was inaugurated just three and a half weeks ago, now looks like. That was school number 40. Mm -hmm. um, three big rooms will serve about 100 kids. Breaking the cycle, sending friends in Madagascar, sends uh, most of the kids in Florida create these, um, these boxes of school supplies and other stuff for the kids that go over. And, and Pete and friends in Madagascar send a full cargo container of school supplies and other things over every spring. It's, it's, it's a huge success. There's Piero. Um, and these are some of my Malagasy graduate students. And this is what the future of environmental management in Madagascar looks like. It doesn't look like us. It doesn't come from here. It comes from there. The problems and the solutions are all local. And these guys are going to be equipped to make the right decisions for the environment in the future. I want to see one of these guys be the Minister of the Environment before I'm here. I would love to see that. Piero's already been asked if he wants to be Minister of Education <laughs> um, it's because of the Friends of Madagascar School Building staff. All of this experience has translated into something I'm very lucky to be a part of, National Geographic's Big Cats Initiative, which even though FUSA are not cats, um, uh, geographic, uh, two years after I became an explorer with them, asked if I would help work with the Big Cats Initiative, which is National Geographic's own um, endeavor to do everything they can to halt the global population decline of big cats. And one of the most astounding things that I've come to realize is that the problems facing big cats at the local levels have a lot of the same dynamics that we've experienced in Madagascar. And all of the solutions that people need to engage in at the local level, people doing the stuff we've done in Karabatska for 20 years. There are people doing this kind of stuff with big cats all over the world, too. And so the Big Cats Initiative is built on three simple things. Assessment, protection, and communication. Assessment, there's a team of, of grad students, of which Chris was a part, uh, here at Duke that is the academic engine of the BCI, the Big Cats Initiative. And they inform the protection pillar, which is the second pillar which is based in a grants program that has now funded since 2010 62 projects in 23 countries um, doing the same kinds of things with big cats like you've seen related to the FUSA. And I've got to tell you, these guys are amazing. They're, they're extraordinary. And this, this is the location of all, of all of the grants. Unfortunately, there's so many of them now, it's even on this big projector, so hard to see who they are and what they're doing. But the common thread across all of them is that they're most active at the local level, at the interface between people and wildlife and trying to find solutions where they collide so that both aren't lost in the long. 
And that's what the BCI does from its protection pillar, which all feeds into the third pillar, which is communication. Communication is something that National Geographic does very well. And by having good information from the field, success stories, and importantly, awareness of what doesn't work in the field as well, we can communicate those things and build more awareness into that synergistic cycle of assessment, protection, and communication to actually start getting towards achieving the goals that we have for conserving not only big cats or not only for me, for FUSA and Madagascar, but biodiversity in general. There's a common thread through all of this, and one of the most important things to take home with you is that the problems originate on a local level. The solutions must as well. Thank you. Oh. All right. Yeah, at this point, we will take questions. And turn on the air conditioner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good question. That was my first question, too. That's an appropriate first question. Um, now, it's interesting because they look cat-like, they look yes. dog-like. What, what is it? Uh, they've been grouped in the civet and mongoose family. They've been grouped in the cat family. Um, there's actually now a determination that all of the carnivores on Madagascar are members of their own family called the Euphluridae. But if you had to imagine, and, and the, the shorthand I used to describe this, you can't imagine what the common ancestor when the cats and the hyenas and the mongooses look like. Just as most of the primates we see on Madagascar are more quote unquote primitive than we see in the rest of the world. But if we had to imagine what the common ancestor between those two animals looked like, I'd say it probably looked a lot like a How do you spell it? Is it F O F O S A is the Malagasy way of spelling it. There's an anglicized way of spelling it, F O S S A. Yeah. Uh, which is also very confusing because the Malagasy civet which is this little white speckled cat size um, small carnivore in Madagascar. Their genus name is FOSSA. So what I try to do for Cryptoproctopherox, which is the scientific name of this, Cryptoproctopherox, let's break that down. Ferox is Latin, fierce. Uh, crypto means elusive or hidden. Procta, anybody want to take a gander at that one? Yeah, so the scientific name literally translates into fierce hidden asshole. <laughs> um, and if you're a lemur, you agree. Yeah. Um, but but uh, one, one of the most interesting things that they found about it is they were first describing this, and I'm, I'm sorry if we have to bleep that out on, on, online or something, <laughs> but, but uh, um, it, is that there's a scent gland in between a double anal sphincter, uh, and that was apparently fascinating for the bug at home from Madagascar when it was first described in the 1800s. Um, and so that's why it's called Cryptoproctopherox. Um. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's a concern. And they're not found anywhere but there? Only Madagascar, and there's only probably about 3,000 of them left. There are 49 of them in captivity uh, in North America, and a little over 100 in captivity worldwide. Are they not Another good question. I'm embarrassed I didn't answer it during the talk. One of the first <laughs> things that we had to find out with the radio telemetry, obviously, was looking at activity patterns. Uh, and it turns out that everybody thought, oh, they must be nocturnal because nobody ever sees them. But in fact, they're just incredibly elusive. They're active almost equally both day and night, three hours on, four hours off, three hours on, four hours off. They're most active at dusk and dawn. So um, you know, if I had to throw one word, you could, you, could, you could throw crepuscular out there at it. But they are active at other times during the day and night on a pretty regular cycle as well. So. Uh, if you're nocturnal or diurnal uh, and you think that's going to be an evolutionarily stable strategy to avoid uh, predation by Fusu, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what is your lifespan? Uh, in captivity, the oldest one that ever lived in captivity was 23 years. Uh, at 18 is, is a good target in captivity, and we don't know them a lot. We've had some that we've caught year after year based on what we, how old we thought they were when we first caught them, um, have been at least 12. What are some examples of things that they eat besides leaves? Uh, we have found everything. We even found fish. Uh, we, fa we found uh, all kinds of rodents, chameleons, snakes, all the brown birds, um, and even wild pigs. And they're not. Now, wild pigs are obviously much, much, much bigger than Fusa. There's no telling if they weren't scavenging one that was already dead. Uh, but I've had more than one person tell me a story of seeing a Fusa clamp down on a wild boar screaming its head off, running through the forest um, at the end of the dry season, and the risk-reward um, 
rules of the game sometimes change when the potential prey items are much fewer and farther between that they go after the bigger, riskier packs of energy towards the end of the season there. Uh, and I've had that story told to me in different places on more than one occasion that, 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 that people have been aware of FUSA hunting while bored. Let's get big. Yes? How big are they? How big are they? That's another really good question. So a FUSA, if it was standing right here, its head would be about this tall, so a little less than knee high. But the cool thing about them is that their bodies are like this. They're, they're the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. So their bodies would be about this big. That's, that's a pretty good size for so two and a half feet or so for just the tip of the nose to, to, to its back end. But then its tail is longer than its body. And the interesting thing about FUSA is they don't grab onto things with their tail. Like you see monkeys in um, South America, they grab onto things and hang from their tails. FUSA don't use it like that. What they do is they throw it back and forth. Like you ever seen a tightrope walker with that big pole that they move back and forth to help them walk across a tightrope? Well, FUSA throw their tails back and forth. And this you know, 20 to 30 pound animal can go through terminal branches of trees as easily as a squirrel. They can just move through the terminal branches. I've also seen them doing very delicate, precarious, you know, one foot on a different branch, you know, pencil thick, trying to get a hold of something that was, you know, on, on a terminal branch of a, of a little tree that was not connected to any other ones and uh, trying to get out to the end of it to find out what they're going to do. So they use that big, long tail uh, for balance as opposed to grabbing it. Good question. What's their social life like? Are they solitary? They are solitary. Um, Fusa are solitary. Uh, we have seen, interestingly enough, what we believe to be sibling pairs that form coalitions, particularly when the density of predators in an area is high. Um, sibling pairs are something that we've seen on more than one occasion and in more than one place. But generally, they're solitary. Yes. Are they very territorial? Are they territorial, yes. And big territories? Or? Big territories, about 12 to 13 square kilometers. How many infants at a time? Um, in captivity, we've, we've seen four very regularly. I've never seen more than two infants with a mom and a one. What's the distribution? The distribution all over Madagascar where there is forest or supposed to be forest, so almost kind of a ring-like distribution around the Couple things. You imply that the um, Malagasy are um, afraid of them. Are there instances of Pusa eating humans or attacking there, humans? Good question. There and are no instances. Sorry, my other yep. question was: um, You said that there's like 49 in captivity here mm -hmm. in North America. Where would that be? Okay. Um, in uh, Madagascar, there is folklore about them being the big bad wolf, and people are afraid of them. There's no reported instances of Pusa actually going up to people and attacking them. As far as I'm aware, I've never had that story told me that someone says, oh, a Fusa came up to my brother-in-law and it chewed his ankle off. And, uh, because any time we ever encounter them, they're going like smoke. I mean, they're, they're out of there. Um, and in North America, where can you find them? My favorite place to go see Fusa is in the Naples Zoo in Florida. They actually do have Fusa, I believe, in Greensboro. I've just learned. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to going and checking those out to see how they're doing. They have them in the Bronx Zoo. They have them at San Diego. They have them uh, at the Henry Gorley Zoo in Omaha, which is another absolutely phenomenal place. Um, so There's one in um, Los Angeles, and the cage right next door to the Arthur Weimer. Are they having any breeding problems with those weird <laughs> <laughs> Imagine! Can you, can you imagine? Uh, you're like, yeah, rough. They've just been moved. Good, good call. We finally. <laughs> Good call. Good call. Because the laborers are probably, I'm sure, up in the far high corner going, yeah. and, and the fish are probably going back and forth along the side of the thing. Because when a fusa looks at something, the first thing, I mean, and you can tell when you're looking at the fusa, when they look at anything, the first thing that goes to their head has to be, and this is me putting words into their mouths, obviously, and they're not words because they don't have words, but um, is can I eat that? Can I eat that? Anthropomorphization is a dangerous thing, but I just did it. Are they tracking by scent or whatever they're eating or by sight? Or? Well, they, they definitely use olfaction a lot. They also scent mark themselves a lot, so I'm sure that plays a very important role. Um, their favorite lemur to eat, the one that we find most that makes up the most biomass of their diet, is the lepa lemur, the sportive lemur, which also does not have a good survival strategy. This is a nocturnal lemur that sleeps in tree holes, which are often very shallow, 
and it reuses tree holes or a series of tree holes. And so if you're a fusa which can climb trees like a squirrel, all you have to do is know where those tree holes are, go from place to place, go to the next one, climb up the tree with the left one, reach in, and hey, it's a happy view. Um, that's, that's a little less than a kilometer of, uh, uh, sorry, a little less than a kilogram of lemur right there that you just got by essentially climbing a tree and reaching in a hole. So how many do you have collared and following? We have captured a little over a hundred in the last 20 years in all of the places that we've worked in the last and 18 years. Right now? Right now we're not collaring any of them because with the technology when we were doing radio telemetry before, we answered all the questions we wanted to ask. But we've got some support um, actually from the Naples Zoo and from students in Collier County, Florida, among other places, who are helping us to buy satellite collars. Uh, where we're going to get GPS points and very, very fine-scale habitat use um, information, which will be much better than such of the, the very coarse-scale activity stuff that we were getting before. So I'm looking forward to having uh, Sam Merson, who's, who's a student of mine, uh, going back um, for his third trip to Madagascar this, this next summer and calling some, along with colleagues from Henry Dorland Zoo and other places, too. Are the FUSA hunted at all? FUSA are hunted. FUSA are actually the only collectively hunted bushmeat target species, according to Chris Foley. Um, uh, and, and he was, he was a, a surprised to learn that the people do go hunt FUSA, uh, and they go out in parties to hunt FUSA, as opposed to just ones that would be going one person going and snaring and things like that. It's not a preferred food item um, over a lot of other things. But yes, they are definitely on the record as being on the menu for bushmeat. Any more questions? Do you have a current population estimate? 3,000. About 3,000. Um, we were in uh, Madagascar recently, and we actually saw one for a few minutes and ran through the forest running in Lucky. There. And what, what we, the, the people we were with weren't so skilled in English as you are. So <laughs> we weren't quite able to understand this part, but like the guidebook that we had, we had the Brock book, and mm -hmm. it said something like, you know, who's are like dogs, but they're like cats. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, do they behave more like cats than dogs? I think Fusa behave like Fusa. I would not try to categorize Fusa anything other than, than, than what they are in terms of, you know, the, 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 the certainty that they have when, when they're about to do something like break out of one of our traps that nothing's going to stop them from, from, from doing that. And, and they've destroyed lots and lots of traps. And, and we've caught them the next day, and they've been fine. Metal traps. Metal traps. And they've been fine. But uh, and, and, you know, we knew it was that one because it was in the area, and we had uh, uh, camera traps and stuff like that. They just have this determination that if they're going for something, they're pretty singular in that, which, which, I, which you know, is, is, again, attributing a lot of characteristics that the, the zoologists in us would, would not want to, but, but I'm, I'm astounded by the determined nature they have and the confidence of certainty that if they go for something, they're going to get it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to call them more cat-like or dog-like. Certainly not dog-like, um, because they're not friendly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said they, they fish. Do they go in the water? We don't know. Uh, the fish could have been washed up on the bank that we found in, in the scats, and I don't want to. I don't want to say yes. We should go to the riverbanks and they go fishing. We've never seen it yeah. uh, when we were radio tracking. Obviously, we had them near rivers and things like that. Um, so we can't say with absolute certainty that they're going in and they're doing a, a bear thing, or like, like you would see bears. Well, they got, in the water. Well, they got across rivers somehow, uh, and, and they're definitely known to do that. So they've got to. But you know, we, we've never actually physically seen it. So. Yeah. Maybe they're finding things to leave over or something like that. But we have definitely found scats with fish bones in it. Last one. Inside the coloration between Good question. Difference in size and coloration between males and females. Males are a little bit larger. Um, coloration is largely very similar uh, across all of them. Males are generally larger than females by 15, 20%. And interestingly enough, in areas where we've trapped large numbers of them, have a higher population density and therefore likely more competition for mating and food resources, the males are disproportionately larger than the females in areas where you find the FUSA in low population densities and probably less competition going on. So a uh, little anecdotal evidence there of, of a certain arms race that comes in driving sexual dimorphism there. So, so.
good question to end on. Thank you guys so much for your attention. Thank you.